this first design one of the turret why did the, they change that to the Syrian term yeah okay we have to remember that uh, this was the first attempt to mount the long 88 in a turret it uh, long 88 the l71 wouldn't fit in a the former tiger one turret um, and anyway that had by the time they were designing this, that had bad practice in that it was vertical sides to the turret. So they were trying to get away and move towards this slope turret. Um, this was the first design. And the, the, what they found was when they started manufacturing these, and I'm talking about Krupp Steelworks were manufacturing them, they found it extremely difficult to bend this front part of the turret out of a piece of armour. And that was against the practice um, where they were using welded armour plate. Uh, in general, Germany didn't go for cast uh, construction. So whereas in Russia with the T-34, you had a cast turret, so this shape was perfectly okay as a casting. But in Germany, they were trying to use normal roll plate for reasons that they could get better quality plate and produce it quickly. But when they started to bend it, this was a major problem. And some of the first turrets were having such difficulties that they were getting cracking in the, in the armor they were then requesting to the here's Waffenamt, could they could they repair these before delivery and it was just a bad feeling about this so once the first 50 had been manufactured for the Porsche Tiger 2 they uh, they were going to switch over to the Syrian term where they basically made the front of the turret more more narrow and were able to put in a single piece of 200 millimeter armor into the in place of this so, so it was simpler to, to produce, that, yes. that, that was the main reason. Yeah, and, and also um, just by the pressure of trying to resolve these issues and come up with a better design, they were making the front of the turret smaller. And we know that in the Panther, they were trying to create a small term, which was a small front on it. So there was less of a target from the front of the vehicle. Yeah, so the, in, in fact, two, two different aspects of making it easier and also reducing the the target area yes, yes. from from the yeah. front yeah and then obviously the problem also with this bent method is you still have to make these penetrations the two for the uh, periscopic uh, for the telescope uh, for the gun sight so you've got a binocular uh, gun sight at this time. Later they were able to simplify that down to a single hole uh, and that again reduced the amount of openings in the front of the, of mm -hmm. the vehicle. And on the other side there is a one single hole for the machine gun. Yes, that's for the coaxial machine yeah. gun, yes. Um, and what can you say about this sloped frontal armour? Is that a reason to, to get a better protection or are there other reasons for this sloped armor? It's, uh, we talked about this earlier, that is a sort of a compromise for yes. several reasons. Well, you could, the, 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 the first thing they had to do is leave enough space up the front of the vehicle for the gearbox and uh, pre-selector gearbox that we looked at in the glass case. So the slope is to some extent governed by that, but obviously at the time this seemed like a very good way of defeating incoming rounds because in theory they could uh, bounce off. So you've got an, in be, uh, if the armor was vertical, you get a, a one thickness if it's on its side, it's a further distance to go through. Now that's not absolutely true, but um, at the time that was seen as a good idea. The, the complications obviously were that you had to devise a very intricate Kugelblend, as they call it, ball mount for your, for your whole machine gun. And um, they had to stop cutting holes in it. So they designed this uh, periscopic, uh, um, arrangement for the driver to view out. But the problem with that is it's up high and the driver can't see what's going on down down close to the vehicle. So it, it creates extra strain on the driving. Mm -hmm. So uh, if they have sloped the armor a, a lot more to get better protection, you would have increased the 
space on the inside. Oh, yeah, then you have a problem. Which which you can't use. Exactly, you can't get in, you have a space that you can't use. So you you avoid that unless, I mean, obviously in some modern tanks they've been able to make a greater slope, but there's nothing in there except the driver's feet. Or maybe a fuel tank or... or Something like that, yes, whatever whatever. filler they put in. But but at this design where the, and the Germans had, had decided that the front drive was the, the correct way forward. Once you adopt that as a standard, then you have to leave enough space for the transmission. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, this here, by the way, some people mightn't recognize it, but that's just the mount for the uh, headlight and a special six inch uh, 150 millimeter Bosch headlight went in there, which when you take the cover off is quite intricate uh, and giving that uh, projection of the beam downwards so that it can't be seen by aircraft. So it, it's both a headlight and a sort of a no, no-tech light. Oh yes, yes, it, yeah. it, it, in, it, in it the does same. the same job. The, the no-tech tended to have that cover over it and project it downwards. There's all that same arrangement inside what you see is the normal round looks like just a headlight with a cover yeah, on yeah. it that's so it's quite quite complicated thing yes uh, just to create the light yeah. so and um, if you if you if you wanted to drive as a normal car headlight you took that cover off and you took out there was a you adjusted the settings and so forth and then you had a normal headlight mm-hmm. but the, the the cover had a, a second layer in it with a lot of intricate little things that you could modify the beam setting why, why make thing, things simple when you can complicate it? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, how, how about the, the, the gun? What, what's special about this, this gun compared to other guns that were also available and the later ones that came on, on the later King Tigers? Well, in the uh, first version of the 88L71, they uh, produced them by a single piece barrel um, and that was just the natural evolution to that but they then realized that there, with these high velocity uh, large caliber guns that there could be quite a bit of wear and sometimes the wear inside was in particular sections of the barrel mm-hmm. um, so the the way of solving that was to bring in a two-piece gun so on later Tigers, you see um, uh, the collar runs out much further to about here, and the, when you can you can unbolt the collar, and inside you can unbolt the tube, so the the gun tube comes in two sections, so you could replace one section at a time, and that just made it easier to keep the gun in good condition, and also probably easier to manufacture. Oh yes, well yes, that's right, because this you have to bore the full length of it. But there were no difficulties in, in getting the, the alignment of the gun with a two-piece? No. No. Not that, well, I've never heard of any problem. I've never seen any complaints about that. Because this technique had already been introduced for the flat guns, which were produced in huge numbers. Uh, okay, they're, uh, they're an 88. Their L, L56 is 50 to 6 times the 88 is the length of the of the from the breech to the front of the muzzle not the muzzle brake but but the rest of the gun and uh, for that because they were being used to fire a lot of shells up at the aircraft coming over they had the same problem and they solved it by putting in that two-part uh, gun barrel so it was a well well proven technique at that stage mm-hmm. we talked earlier about uh, the the radio equipment and using radios in vehicles like this you need to have uh, some power to to keep them going yes um, and that of course caused a bit of problem so how do they how do they so solve well, that yeah I don't, I don't think it caused too much problem for 
at this vintage of, of the vehicle in say 44 um, the normal tank is using an FU5 with a 10 watt sender and 10 watt receiver they took the power from the engine for that um, but for the command vehicles that's different because then you have a 30 watt sender and receiver uh, and you have a separate f uh, normal uh, 10 watt arrangement as well so you have a lot of uh, equipment there so what they did was to, uh, because a command vehicle tended to be sitting around taking messages, they didn't always want to run the engine and use up the fuel supply, so they put in a little uh, um, generator set, which was known as a GG400, um, and they took out some of the ammunition that was stored in the, in, in the ammunition bays at the side and put in the generator there so they could run it uh, while they were running the radios without having to run the main HL230. And that's something that's similar to later versions of, of uh, the, the British Centurion where you have the generator uh, beside the power pack and also in the chief, chief tank okay, yeah. you have yeah. a generator. <clears throat> yeah. So you don't have to run the engine all the time. Exactly, uh, yes. So um, yeah. it's the same idea that comes yeah, up it, again and again. But people shouldn't think that the radios were always in these vehicles because no, course, at this period they, they were but um, if you go back to the Panzer 3s or Panzer 2s, Panzer 1s, none of those vehicles had radios until a certain point in time. Generally speaking you could say about 1941 was when general use of radios was uh, was permitted. Before then they weren't and they, but then they started to equip all the vehicles with uh, small sets that they could talk to, to other tanks in the unit in the near vicinity and then they could talk to a, a command vehicle or a radio vehicle. So there was a whole range of half tracks and armoured cars that were radio vehicles who carried these big, big radios and they transmitted the signals back to the headquarters people. Well, obviously, the, it must be remembered that the commander's couple is missing because this was a test vehicle that was torn apart and put back together again several times to look at the techniques for manufacturing and uh, for other issues involved. So it's not 100% complete. Uh, that's, that's an important thing. Um, well, looking at the, at the back of the vehicle, there's a couple of things of note. The big opening in the back of the turret was for a hatch that could be removed, which gave a very convenient uh, way of taking the complete gun out if it was going to be serviced without having to dismount the turret. Um, the small hatch that we have uh, seen earlier well, that came from the, Sw the Swedish uh, Tiger II that goes in the middle and that is the normal day-to-day -day operational turret that could either be used as an escape hatch or could be used to conveniently load the ammunition into, in through the turret because on either side of the turret there were ammunition racks uh, so that the, the, the first access that the loader had was to take the uh, ammunition from the racks at the back of the turret then they had down in the sponsons at the side of the vehicle there was additional racks. Other things on the back of the vehicle that are worth noting I suppose most of all is the uh, this exhaust configuration which is a little bit unusual because a normal uh, Tiger II just had a pipe coming up here but they had already established with the HL230 that uh, under certain conditions if they backpedaled uh, very quickly, uh, decelerated, that there was an excess of fuel in coming through the carburetors and would cause uh, a very big uh, flashback and would illuminate the whole area, which was very bad, obviously, traveling at night or indeed during the day because people could see from far away any uh, exhaust flash. And we see on the experimental vehicles, we see uh, some evidence of mounting a flambonictor, which was the device they had invented for the Panther, which is a big wide pipe with a cowl on it. But here in the case of the uh, Tiger II, because this is all a little bit higher, they actually mounted them on the side so that they, they exhaust it in this direction here. They can be seen on the photographs. That's the possible explanation of that. But there is some other 
possibilities. We have to always remember that this particular vehicle was a, a Versuchsfahrzeug, so they were testing out all the various new ideas that were being requested along the line, and the, the test station were constantly getting orders to try this, try that, try something else. Whether it ever went into production, we don't know, unless it turns up in the manufacturing process, which we didn't see. Okay, so here's a very distinctive thing, and um, that's with the producing technology. What, what could you tell, tell us about that? Yeah, uh, this technique of interlocking the armor was uh, introduced on German vehicles um, approximately, I think the first time I remember seeing it was maybe in 1941-42. And it was just that they had realized that with the heavier anti-tank guns uh, arriving along, that an impact, um, uh, well, let's say we take this joint here, this is the rear plate and it's welded down along here, obviously welded on the inside, but by putting this interlocking into the armor, it just made a stronger joint and you welded that in and put a plug in here so that it was all very tightly locked together and it could t absorb the impact of quite a strong anti-tank round without, uh, we're not talking about pr uh, penetration, but just the sheer impact because a vehicle is destroyed if it cracks and the yeah. well pops open, then it has to be sent back to a specialist firm for repair. So, in fact, what, what, what we can see here is the, the actual thickness of the rear, rear plate. More or less. Normally, if that's the thickness. It, they, they, what they did tend to do was to narrow this down a little bit in order to be able to fill with the weld. And at the front, is it the same or, or is or Yeah, no, no, it's absolutely the same that you had the interlocking sections yeah, but the, that the, we the, saw the, earlier on. The thickness on. Of, of the armor, yeah. could that be, be that we... It'd well, be in and about uh, what you're seeing is the, the thickness of the lower plate or the thickness of the side plates and so forth. But it's, it's as I say, it's only nominally that because at the back here, the black plate is 80 millimeters. I, I would say that when we measured that, we would find that it's only a about 60 to 65 because they have taken a piece off, beveled it off so as to leave space for the welding because there's very extensive welding going in yeah, all the way yeah. in here. This is a very long, tedious job for welding that. And how do you know that there's an 80 millimeter in there? Uh, the specification of the plate. And where have you found them? Uh, well, you can get the specifications from the original drawings for, that were sent to Dortmund and for, to uh, the Krupp Steelworks. They had to make plate to this specification, had to be within two millimetres of the correct thickness. And uh, that was then the plate that was used for this purpose. And there was inspections all the way along. And if we sandblasted this vehicle, we would find all sorts of numbers stamped into these plates where they have uh, the batch numbers, um, and so forth, and, and also where the inspector at the steel company had accepted this plate as being valid, and then it would go to the cutting department and be cut into the right shapes uh, and uh, eventually welded together. That work was all done by a steel company, so the big steel companies involved in uh, Tiger II would have been um, the Dortmund Hoder Hutenverein in Dortmund and you would have got um, Krupp doing and also the Eisenberg Oberdonau would have been involved as well and their job was to make the tub of the, the hall and that would then be delivered to an assembly company for the Tiger II, the only one assembly company that's Henschel, they would do the chassis, have it, bring it out, test it for generally 50 kilometers driving and adjust all the uh, fittings and then it would go back to the Henschel works and Wegmann, who were a factory nearby, would deliver a completely finished turret. But they got the steel. Yeah. Surround so the, 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 the sort of chassis box yeah. was transported from the steel company to Henschel and Henschel did all the to put in all the, all the bits, yeah, and put and in the engine and put in the suspension and all the other tiny fittings inside. Um, and then that would be tested before a turret would be fitted. And then Wegmann, 
who today make the Leopard, uh, yes. they would have delivered the turrets to um, Henschel and the turret would be just sat in and that's it, job done. And it is amazing information that you have found from uh, documents in the archives and when was the first, which year we, did you go to the archives in, in Germany and to, to try to figure, find it out? Well, I, I was involved in my first publications back in 1964. When I was born. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I basically depended on not knowing any better for the first number of years. I depended on researching all of the documentation that the Allies, particularly the British, had accumulated. But the Americans and the British were accumulating documents and those documents would be available in places like uh, the Tank Museum in Bovington, the Imperial War Museum, the Public Records Office. But by the late 60s I began to realise that this wasn't 100% reliable because these were documents that were produced by people at the time. And you know, even a, and there were very good intelligence officers available studying this material, um, but they were just making assumptions about what the Germans were doing because they had, didn't have access to the factories. So um, I obviously had made contact with Spielberger, or he made contact with me, and we were starting to work together. So I had access for the first time to original doc German documents that he was collecting through his circle of contacts and they were some quite amazing contacts. I mean he he was friendly with uh, Oberst Icken who was the uh, was an inspector in the Heers Waffenamt and had been responsible for the taking on of the Czech 38T vehicles that are so important in Sweden. Uh, back in 1939 he had been involved in that. So he had a lot of information, he had a lot of contacts and then through him Spielberger would have been working with uh, Colonel Esser who was the commander of Kummersdorf and he had his papers and, and information so we we're getting information from there and then there was a, an Austrian um, um, technical uh, inspector a guy who was very uh, prominent in the field at the time he was in uh, helping out on research and then Spielberg was friendly with uh, Meyer Becker who did all of the improvised anti-tank guns and things mounted on the French chassis and on, on, on captured British tanks so that was probably the first um, access to original documents but then if you go a little bit further by that stage the American archives are starting to become uh, to release classified documents which would be captured German documents and the Americans transferred a lot of documents back to Germany and they turned up in the Bundesarchiv so that from the early 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s onwards, you had the Bundesarchiv releasing documents as they arrived in from the States and were declassified and so forth. So through all of those methods and of course going on and on you, you get to know more and more collectors and people that are interested and you have access to documents and it's like putting together a big jigsaw in reverse. Mm -hmm you're finding documents and a, one document which would have meant nothing to me in my early days uh, today if I see it I immediately know what it means and where it fits in in the overall situation and there are documents all over the world there's even private collectors have documents um, and I'm one friend of mine uh, in Germany uh, he purchased um, a box of paper from somebody whose relation had been involved and this box of information was the guy's collection of what he thought was important from his days um, when he was a technical guy with uh, one of the companies that developed all the half cracks and so forth it's absolutely jammed with the original information so it's that way that you get the documents and it <clears throat> this proved that the importance of finding the 
the original documents and to be able to to establish what what was actually happening in instead of using assumptions and the later production that that might be a bit wrong and then all of a sudden you can find that this information that we have known for 50 years is actually wrong. Oh yes, absolutely. This is this is the correct. When so you get back and you start finding the original documents from the companies reporting what they're manufacturing, what the problems they're having, uh, that sort of document is is invaluable. And the books then, by the by the 1980s, we were we were we had decided to stop reading the Allied documents, even though it was very convenient, they were written in English and so forth, but they were only showing a view of the information which may not be correct. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't really uh, differentiate between Henschel doing the chassis and Wegmann, they just looked at the overall production of Tiger, uh, because that's all that mattered to the, yeah, of course. Uh, them in the, in the wartime period. and. Um, once we established what the primary documents were, then we started concentrating on those. So in our Tiger books and then in all the Panzer tracks, we only use documents, uh, or we only use information that's coming from original documents. Now, sometimes it's helpful that you have an allied report that helps you interpret the yeah, original document, but the original information is what you have to go by. And Sometimes it's disappointing because the original information is very boring by comparison to the intelligence reports. <laughs> yeah, and you have put it into to writing and saved the information for the rest of the world. And we have done this film today. Yeah, you talking and with this, and what... it's fan absolutely fantastic. So, and and I continue on doing the research. Uh, with anything new that turns up and try to produce books on that but also I hope I contribute to the museums by helping out with research on vehicles and in the I'm a trustee of the Wheel Foundation and there we take vehicles and completely restore them to as near to a hundred percent as we can get so that someday they'll be there for other people to look at when we've passed on. Yeah, thank you. Good.